Now that we've gone through the process of proving this statement is true, that for all epsilon greater than zero, we can find a natural number n with one over n less than epsilon. We can elevate that from the, from the statement prove uh, into calling it, we could call it a theorem. I'm going to call it a lemma. So we want to use this lemma, now that you've all proven it, uh, to establish a proof of the density theorem. And to get us started on that process, so this is the back of a sugar packet version of the statement of the density theorem, right? Quick and easy, Q is dense in R. Um, so if we unpack that a little bit, just by reminding ourselves what the definition of dense is, um, how would I say that in a version that maybe doesn't fit on the back of a sugar packet, um, but which explains a little bit more about what dense actually means? So we're making the claim that for all x and y that are real, as long as x is less than y, I'm just going to stick that in here too to remind ourselves. So that's part of the hypothesis. For all x and y that are real numbers with x less than y, we can find a rational number uh, r, so it's an element of the set q, which is in between x and y, strictly in between. So it belongs to the open interval from x to y. So that's an unpacking. That's just a restatement of this sentence up here at the top, reminding us what the burden of proof is here, using the definition of density. Right? So this also exposes the logical structure of the claim that we're making. Here's the logical expansion, or maybe it's even an abbreviation, of the statement we're trying to prove. For all real numbers x and y, with x less than y, there exists a rational number r such that x is less than r, which is in turn less than y. So if we're following the same kind of pattern that we followed in our Archimedes proof, what should be the first thing that I write as part of my proof? Make peace with the fact that we are not choosing x and y that they are being chosen for us. And usually the verbiage for that, just as it was in our last proof, is to say, let's let x and y, real numbers, be chosen. Passive voice, because we're not the agents of that choice. Uh, and then we'll make the assumption here, x being less than y. So there's the first line of our proof. That brings x and y onto the table. It brings them into existence. And I'm going to put them on our number line here somewhere. I don't know where they are. I just know that x is less than y, so I'm going to write it like that. All right, so now x and y are in existence. Um, what's the next task in our burden of proof? Where is r going to come from? Well, who gets to choose r, maybe is what I'm trying to ask. That's on us. Right, so now the burden of proof is on us to make an R. Um, so somewhere in here, I'm going to write, uh, let us define. So there's the, there's the agency coming back to us, right? Let us define R. I'm going to draw R in a different color here. Let's make it purple. And R needs to be rational. And then we're going to have to figure out how to define that R. So I'm leaving us some, some space. We need some wiggle room here. Um, and then just to finish the scaffold of the proof, the ultimate thing that we need to conclude is that R is between X and Y. So that's what I'll write as kind of my last line. Thus, X is less than R, less than Y, completing the proof. So now I know what my proof is going to look like overall. But the devil, as always, is in the details. So we have to figure out how it is that we're going to define this R. Right? So this is the big open question for us. We need to be able to, regardless of what the x and y are that are chosen by the universe for us, we need to be able to adapt and define an R, or at least show that an R exists that satisfies this property. So here's kind of thinking like an analyst, thinking like somebody who, who writes proofs and analysis. Here's my thought process. We have a lemma up here that establishes that in between two real numbers, namely 0 and epsilon, we can find a unit fraction, 1 over n, right, in the middle there. So this purple lemma up here in the right-hand corner that you all just proved seems like a very similar statement to the one that we're trying to establish. 
which is that in between any two real numbers, x and y, we can find a rational. This is saying in between 0 and any positive real number, we can find a unit fraction, which in particular will also be a rational number. Right? So these two statements seem like they're very similar. And the main task for us is to connect one of them to the other. Classic problem-solving strategy. Reduce a complex problem down into a simpler one that we already know how to solve. So then my question is, is there a way that we can take the interval from x to y, which I'm going to let me shade that in red. Is there a way for us to take that interval and to transform it so that it lies instead on top of the interval from 0 to epsilon? If I can somehow just slide and squish this interval down onto that one, then as soon as it's down here, we know that we have a lemma that will produce a rational number inside there for us. So now comes the fun part. We need to take this interval and slide it down so that instead of its left-hand endpoint being at x, its left-hand endpoint will be at 0. So what's a way that I could do that? First step is I'm just trying to get this x to slide down to the left on the number line to be 0 instead. So how would I do that? I would just subtract x from every element in this interval. So if I subtracted x from every element in this interval, this interval would slide down and become the interval from 0. So if I slide everything in this interval down by subtracting x from every element, then the left-hand endpoint is going to slide down to 0. What's the right-hand endpoint going to slide to? What's my new right-hand endpoint going to be? y minus x. Great. So now I've fixed one of the two endpoints from my difficult problem to match one of the endpoints from my simpler problem, my lemma. So the question now is, um, how about epsilon? Where is my epsilon going to come from? If I want to apply this lemma, we need to supply this lemma with a value of epsilon. If we supply it in epsilon, it's going to give us an n that satisfies certain properties. And then all we have to do is, is figure out why that matters to our original problem. But in our lemma, the left-hand endpoint of the interval that we find a rational number in is 0. The right-hand endpoint is called epsilon. So what should we call epsilon in order to use it in our theorem? Let's just call it the right-hand endpoint of this interval, y minus x. So the idea is that I want to apply this lemma not to the interval from x to y, because we can't do that, but instead apply it to the burgundy interval right here, the interval from 0 to y minus x. So if I want to use this lemma, let's be real explicit, because the lemma has this epsilon in it. So let's just bring onto the table a new uh, personality called epsilon. And let's define it. Let epsilon equal y minus x. So tell me what you know about epsilon based on this definition. First thing we observe about epsilon is it's a real number. How do we know it's a real number? Because x and y are real. And according to our field axioms, the difference of one real number and another real number is, again, a real number. Okay? So if I, anytime I subtract two real numbers, they have a real difference. So we know epsilon is real based on the field axioms. What else do we know about epsilon? What kind of real number is it? Epsilon not only is a real number, it's also a positive real number. And it's positive because we assumed, because that was part of the definition of dense, right? We assumed that x was less than y. And according to the order axioms from earlier in the chapter, the inequality x less than y remains in the same orientation if I subtract x from both sides. I'll get 0 on the left, y minus x on the right. So the order axioms convince us that this is not only a real number, epsilon is not only a real number, but epsilon is a positive real number. And having a positive real number in our life is all that we need in order to go up to this oracle and give it a, a, a burnt offering, a sacrifice, right? Here is my epsilon. Please give me an n. Right. So that's how we're going to use that. That's the transaction that we make with this lemma. Since I have a positive real number, let's invoke that lemma. Here's where we invoke the lemma. 
I'm going to write it in purple. By the lemma, by lemma one, we can feed it this epsilon, and it produces for us a natural number n, such that 1 over n is less than epsilon. So by lemma 1, there is a natural number n, such that 1 over n is less than epsilon. The lemma has given us a 1 over n inside of this interval. So that's great, right? Because 1 over n is what kind of number? It's rational. It happens to be a unit fraction. That doesn't really matter. What, what matters is it's a rational number, where 0 is rational, but epsilon does not have to be rational. Right? So we've now found out something about this smaller interval using this lemma. So the question now is, how do we relate that back? Now that we have a rational number inside the interval from 0 to y minus x, how do we get that rational number back into our interval? I add x to the numbers in this interval on the left. I'm going to get back to numbers in the interval on the right. This is going to turn up another problem for us, though. Uh, and it's one that I'll have to fill in the details, the rest of these details, in a video after class today. So let's define, we're going to try defining our rational number by adding x plus 1 over n. r equals x plus 1 over n. And we knew that 1 over n was in between 0 and y minus x. Therefore, when I add x to all of that, x plus 1 over n is going to be back inside the interval from x to y. I'm going to call it r, but it's really x plus 1 over n. Now my question is, why are we not done? Why doesn't this complete the proof? Poke a hole in this. The problem with this argument so far, and it's one that's fixable, and I'll talk about how to fix it in our next video after class. The problem is that we don't know, based on this definition, whether r is rational or irrational. If x were rational to begin with, then yeah, we'd be all set. r is rational, we've completed the proof. But if x is not rational, then x plus 1 over n will also not be rational. That's something you should convince yourself of, by the way. Irrational plus rational is irrational. Right? And if, that's, if r is irrational, then we have not proven what we were trying to prove. We have not created the right kind of r to satisfy this statement. So we'll see how to patch that up next.